Happy Friday, everybody. We are going to get started in another minute just to give a few more folks some time to get logged into the webinar. But thank you for joining us today. All right, I think we can go ahead and get started. Uh, David, Renato, Aaron, yep. give, give you the floor. So, I uh, hope this time I wish the proper screen. Let me know if you didn't get the right one. <laughs> good, good to go. <laughs> okay, perfect, thank you. So, hello everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to close so the 10th edition of the, um, the CTF, so the virtual one, and hopefully the last one. Um, so a few points we would like to bring before passing the floor to the winning team. It's uh, maybe just recap a bit who is behind the CTF this year. Um, some statistics, who the, win, who the, who the, sorry. Uh, the winning team will give us presentation. So uh, nothing for me there. Uh, and a few closing words after the presentation. So a small reminder for those that missed the, the intro call, the CTF is now organized as a special interest group of first for four years now, if I'm correct, uh, with a team which is mentioned there. And so for the second edition this year, we team up with DHS CISA. So you can see that we have the support of first and many of our employer and colleagues there to prepare you those challenge. And also keep info up. So just to give an idea, we have Mattermost up and running for the chat. CTFD, we collect all the logins Splunk. Uh, and we also have an S3 bucket for the big files and plus the Docker server also. So it was uh, the infra behind. Uh, in terms of some figures, so for this year, we have prepared 50 challenge. Uh, we had participants from 59 countries. Um, Total number of challenges growing. So that's typically interesting when we we'll offer live challenge all year long. Uh, on the 435 participants that registered via first, we had 78 active. So we count as active people that really play along the week uh, for a total of 60 team, uh, sorry, 60 team registered, 42 active. Um, which led to this, uh, which was the top 10 evolution over the week, uh, which was quite interesting. So you can see that the, the winning team, hope you can see, uh, there was actually very, very close to the second team, very, very close to the third and fourth team. And it was quite challenging up to the last minute to know who will be the winner of this edition. So congratulations, congratulations to all those teams. Uh, I guess it was, well, well deserved for those that uh, that reach the top three, and that's also obvious when you look at the score, which are very very close for the first five teams, um, and all the the team actually score quite well. So our winners for this edition uh, at the third position we have Blue Shells, second position Last of Us, Last Four of Us, sorry, and our winner are EPT. Uh, which means that EPT, it's now your time to present uh, and explain a bit how you, how you win. Yeah, all right. Let me see. I need, I guess you need to stop the sharing. Yeah, I will. I'm just searching where Zoom is. No. <laughs> and I hope my Mac won't crash. Okay. All right. Um, I guess you can see my screen now. Yes. Yeah. All right. So we are uh, Eirik Nope and Lukas Piotrowski, who will present to you. 
Uh, we both work as security analysts and instant responders and penetration testers in Equinor. Uh, we'll start out by talking a bit about our company and how we operate in regards to detection, instant response and security testing. Then we'll talk a bit about the CTF and walk through a few challenges. So first of all, Equinor is a global energy company with approximately 20,000 employees plus contractors and consultants. We are headquartered in Stavanger in Norway, where we are sitting right now, but we also have offices in more than 30 countries. Uh, the Equinor Cyber Defense Center, which we are a part of, consists of two main teams. We have a detection team, which is the SOC, and the response team, which is the CERT, where the two of us work, and the rest of our two other team members work as well. Uh, but what might be a bit different is that we also have a internal pen testing team that consists of a subset of the response team. So me and Lucas and two other colleagues uh, are also, I guess, 50% of our work is actually uh, offensive. We do pen tests of uh, both the application and also the larger infrastructure. Uh, and EPT is Equinor's own CTF team. We created the team, I guess, we, uh, maybe two years ago. We started out playing CTFs uh, as colleagues. Uh, and we play maybe from 10 to 30 CTFs a year, uh, both normal CTF time CTFs, but also special events. Like first, this was actually our first time uh, attending the first CTF. But uh, two of us, uh, actually played the ICS CTF, I guess that's two years ago now, when they were attending the conference in person. Uh, most of the people in the team are from the certain SOC, but we also have people from other IT disciplines uh, joining in from time to time when we're playing. And also we use CTFing as competence building, uh, which means that we are allowed to use uh, our work hours, some of it, to play CTFs, and we feel that we are benefiting a lot from doing that. I'll get back to that. Yeah, and uh, when we kind of do uh, security testing, uh, the kind of knowledge we gain through both CTFs and course and conferences, of course, are um, really valuable to us. We learn a lot of um, kind of nitty gritty details doing CTFs and some of these and of course, for war games like Hack the Box, uh, this competence is really useful for us when we are also doing actual work and doing security tests. We also do a yearly purple team engagement of the infrastructure. Uh, and we also, uh, that works kind of like we, uh, most of the CERT team are sitting together in a room. Uh, we start from the inside to so don't do the phishing and everything, but then we just get a plug in the wall and we start hacking. Everything that's not industrial control systems are in scope, and we are collaborating with the detection, kind of like a purple team exercise. To like they kind of, we, we discuss what they see and don't see and so forth. Uh, we don't, so it's, it's not a red team exercise where we actually try to hide. Uh, and all of this offensive knowledge uh, we gain is also super helpful for us as defenders, because I think we get a better understanding of uh, incidents and how attackers think and so forth. And the techniques they are using are the same stuff as uh, we know. And we also uh, improve our security posture a great bit by doing these yearly purple team engagements uh, internally. So uh, we, of course, write finding lists and reports after the, uh, the tests and we use that to improve. For example, Active Directory, we have done tons of work to make sure that we can't get owned by someone getting access to one server and there's one admin logged in there and then you get them credentials and own all our servers. Um, we have created the best enforce and so forth to make sure that we have a, a good security posture in that uh, sense. Yeah, so for the CTF itself, uh, we had a lot of fun. Uh, most of the time we sat together in the office and in the evenings and solved challenges. Uh, some of them, the uh, wave ones, <laughs> we, we had a hard time with. So uh, we used quite a lot of time trying, especially the third one, trying to solve it. So we are really looking forward to the write-up of that one. Um, we are gonna 
walk through hiding in the noise. Lucas will do that, and then I'm going to go through the five HDMI pwn challenges. Or yeah, so Lucas, I guess I will stop sharing, and you can share if I find Zoom. Okay, hello. I will now start sharing as well. Just a second. Screen. Can you see? Okay, perfect. Then uh, let's uh, start. So this is the hiding in the noise uh, first challenge, and uh, we find a pickup there, and we are supposed to find the IP address of the rat. So I have opened here in Wireshark that file already. And uh, I guess our solution was a bit of a, a bit of a lack, or I'm not sure what is the intended one, but when we scroll through these packages, we can notice at some point that there is quite a few malformed packets. And this continues also here and here and here and so on. And they are more like, I think all of them, they are originating from the 91 IP. So it's kind of like, just try. And then I guess we were lucky that we tried this one and that worked. Um, yeah. But that also we can notice that most of that communication is also originating from this IP. So since most of the traffic is there, you can kind of assume that this is most probably the rat. But uh, that's the le less interesting part of this challenge. The more interesting one is the second one, which follows after. So then this is the interesting one, which is hiding in noise two, where we get a DLL that we need to reverse and combine with uh, this pickup to have an understanding. So this I have done here. And if we open the DLL in the dot pick, that's a dot net library, so we can easily see the decompiled code. And as you can see here, we have the program which basically connects to the uh, to the rat, and uh, it supports a few comments like zipping files, sending comments, test alive, create pairs to shut down and die. We are interested in finding the IP address. So if we look again at this, where we want an IP address of a connection that is successful. So then we come back here. Now we can see the result section. So if we go to commands, here we have the compiled a few, and there is the result section. And we can see that these two, if result is true, then we send this data. If it's false, then we send this data. And the major difference between the two is this byte here. When it's false, so if it, the result was unsuccessful, then it's 16. If it was successful, then it's 17. So this is the interesting part. We, we know already that we are looking for a packet that has been successful. So the, the, that will be the first filter that we will use. But then we also want to know which one contains the IP address that we are interested in. If we scroll up here, we can see that the only one that contains the IP address from these comments that were mentioned here, we can see that this one takes an argument. The others do not. So we go here. And then this one, address end, is combined with this IP in order to create an IP address. None of the others do that. So then this becomes interesting for us. So then we come back here. So we are interested in byte. Here we want the value of 47. So that uh, send comment is uh, being executed. And we want this to be uh, the, the byte that I showed before in the result, we want this to be successful. So then we need to set up these filters correctly. We will start with taking a note of this num array because this is sent to command. So we know that this byte is the 
last one here. So then we go to result and we know that this is being sent as part actually of the result comment. So if we go here to result, let's go back down here. That's called return invoke. So we will be interested in this value. So now we can, using all of this information, the other one is return property here. And this, as you can see, num array 16, this is the one that is switched on here. So we want the num array 16 to be 47, which in hex is 2f. So now we can go to Wireshark. Um, and the easiest will be to look at these values. This will make it easier for us, especially the zeros, I think. So if we go to Wireshark, we can scroll all the way. Maybe I'll sort on the source. Then we can go to this 91, which we established before. And we can start comparing these values. We can see there are these zeros here and these Cs here. We go back to our decompilation. 12 is a C, this is a C, and then we have three zeros. So we can notice that this is that part of the packages. And then we are interested in the second from the last one. 17, this one. So we want that one, 17 in hex, that will be 11. This one is 10, so this is not what we want. We can start creating a filter then. I already created it before, so you can see it here in the history. So if we search for this frame, and then how we know these values. So if we mark this one with our mouse, then we can see, uh, I'm not sure how to show it, but on the bottom left, you can see bytes 48 to 60. Now, now it's better visible. So this is 57. That's the one where we want to have 2F. This is 58 and this is 59. So here we want 11, here we want 2F. Right, that's if we come back to the decompilation. This is this byte. And then we're interested in this one, these two. So we come back here, we apply the filter, and then there is only one packet. And then we come back to the decompilation and we want to read this byte. So this is before the zeros and these two Cs. We can go back. We see the zeros, these two Cs, and then there is 8C. Now we can go to Python and we can get an int 0x, 8C. That's 140. That means that if we go here, and we add 140, that's the IP that we have been looking for. And that was the correct flag that was actually solving the challenge here. So this was the interesting part of this challenge, especially if you see that these couple of attempts we had uh, at the beginning were failures because we fell for the fact that this interface that has been shown in here, it's none of the traffic that goes towards that IP is in the pickup. So we, at the beginning, were thinking that about those IPs that show here in the pickup. So that's what threw, them, threw us off. But fortunately, we managed to figure it out before we run out of the attempts. So I guess that's it. And then thanks everyone. And I will stop sharing so Eric can take over on the next challenge. Right, then I will swiftly show you the HDMI phone challenges. Okay, start sharing. Then I guess I don't need the presentation anymore. Uh, so the first, these HDMI, each HDMI poning challenges, you got an uh, elf. And uh, the challenge, the first challenge is you need to find the password 
that can log in as the user engineer. And you can also, HMI Coolant is a Linux binary that is safe to run on your local machine. When you start it, it uh, starts up a server that is listening on port 5050, so you can connect and interact with it. But for the first one, that is not necessary. Uh, all we need to do is to look in IDA. Uh, I obviously have a full IDA license, but uh, also the uh, free version now supports uh, the compilation of uh, x64 uh, binaries. So you can actually grab this for free and be able to, to disassemble and uh, decompile this code. Um, if we look at the main function, we see that there is a connection handler. And if we go there, we can see kind of how to, what uh, it, it does when a new client connect. And the first prints the menu. I guess I can show you this first as well, how it works. I have it running locally. Unfortunately, the remote uh, server is taken down, but I have it running here. So I can do and see local host. And then you can see this is the uh, menu you get. And then you can kind of type status. Um, but now, uh, if you don't do anything else, it will just, yeah, no response. It will fail because if we look further here, we can see that it actually tries to connect to a buscan interface. But we're interested in the login. So if you write login, uh, you get a prompt for a username, and that should be engineer, and then you need a password. That was not correct. So if we look through this code, we can go uh, and find where the login magic is happening, and that is here. First, it writes to the file descriptor uh, the username, then it receives hex 10, 16 bytes back, then it uh, sends our password and wants to receive uh, decimal 33 bytes back into the password buffer. Uh, and then it uh, sends a pointer to this, which is a struct. I haven't uh, rebased it correctly, but it's, it should be a struct. And then it sends that to this uh, function. Um, and here you can see that first it checks if the first eight bytes is engineer. And then if it is, then it compares A1 plus 16, which is basically where the, you entered the password in the buffer, it is staple battery. Correct horse, which is a reference to the uh, password uh, difficulty comic by X yeah, something. I don't remember the name of that comic. And so then we know that the answer to the first challenge is this password. Um, so then the next part of this challenge is to determine the CAN ID and the data this HMI software sends to pull the controllers for their status. So I've never looked at the CAN protocol before, but I started with reversing again. I saw here that there's a function called print PLC status. That looks good to me. And if we go in to the function, we can kind of see that it prints out something about the status. And it uses this A1 as, uh, as the data input to, to if it's uh, running or not. Um, and we can also see that it both read and write, or do can write and do can read. It tests if it can can read. Oh, sorry, this is not correct. This A1 uh, is actually an argument in. What it uses here is like this V13. If that is two, then it runs, writes it's running. If it's one, it says it's crashed, and else it's just stopped. So if we go and have a look what this V13 is, we can see that it's set here to hex 64. And it's part of uh, this. Uh, and also to this can uh, write and read functions, uh, a pointer to V9 is passed. And this is, I could have fixed this up as well, but uh, basically these are 16 bytes that contains different val values. The first one here being an int uh, and is the actual can ID. And then there's, it's kind of weird because then it just says, this V10 is four bytes, but it says the one of the bytes to six, the lowest one, and then it like sets uh, six additional bytes. So we go in here, we can see that that's passed in the pointer to this structure, these 16 bytes, and then we can see that the user is an interface called VCAN0, and it tries to send these 16 hex 10 bytes to the socket. 
So then kind of that's your answer uh, right there. That's the, the bus ID and the message being sent. But then again, there's a protocol in place there. So I, what I tried to do when I saw this, I went here and I did a disassemble the uh, this do can write function. And I found the right here. So I set the breakpoint that do can write plus uh, 286. Then I continue running. And then I do a status here. And then it breaks for me at that exact point when it wants to call it. And then RSI is the first uh, parameter. And then if we do, we can look at those 16 bytes that are present in that. Um, buffer, we can see that it's corresponding to what we saw in IATA. The first two bytes are D903. And this is a 32-bit integer, so that makes sense. And then the 6 is there, also as a 32-bit integer. And then there's some more data. But then I was really confused how I should submit this data. Like, I understood that these three bytes were the ID, but what is this sixth thing? And uh, what are the, like, the data? What is buffer, uh, padding and so on? So what I did in the end to figure this out, I created a VCAN zero interface. You can just uh, yeah, Google how to do it, but basically you uh, yeah, just set it up and then you can start listening for traffic there. And then if I just continue this, uh, it will try to send data to it. As you can see here, I should make this smaller. And then we can go in the data and see. And this uh, Wireshark is great, of course, because it knows the protocol, the CAM protocol. And it kind of tells me that the identifier is 0x3d9, and the data are these six bytes. So then I know my flag is this colon the data. So that was the second challenge. Um, the third one uh, is that they want us to send a close to valve 109. But the issue is that uh, ELF only allows us to interact with valve 100 to 105. So then again, we go back to the disassembly and we can look at the functions. This binary is not stripped, so that's kind of quite nice. And then we see there's a function called change value. So this is, of course, interesting because this is kind of creating the data. Again, I haven't kind of cleaned up either here, so it looks kind of gibberish. Um, but we can see that there is some XORing going on with a PLC code and HMI code. And then there's also a CRC calculation of the data. So an option here could be to actually just do these calculations and create the packet that way. But uh, I thought it was a better idea to see how uh, the binary kind of tells you which uh, poor, uh, valves you can open or not. So then I went and check from where is this function called, because in the function itself, there is no error checking. So then we can see here, we're back in the connection handler function, and we can see that there is an if statement here. This is to open the valve, and there is uh, one more to close the valve. And then it checks like, it reads in uh, an integer, and then it, uh, or it reads in a string, and then parses it to an int. And then it checks that the value of that integer is between 100 and 105. So then what you can do is to find this in, in here. And if we go to change, no, we go to the connection handler. And we scroll to the code, hopefully trying to find it. Of course, I didn't remember what line it's on. But we can look at the strings to cheat. That's factory reset, and then there is who am I? Valid command. Oh, did I go too far now? Oh, open valve. Here we go. And then I ask for which valve you want to open. It reads it in, converts it to an int, and then we can see the compares here to hex 63, which we can comp switch these over to decimal for easy reading. It does these compares, right? It checks that it's above 99. And it checks that it's below or equal to 105. So what I did then, I found this byte. And then we can go to the hex view. And then this is kind of highlighting this exact uh, line of code. So this 69 is the hex or hex 69 is 105. 
and then I can click that byte, and then we can see down here uh, the physical location in the binary where this byte is located. So then you can open the binary in a hex editor, just modify this byte, set it to, for example, 79, and then run the binary. Now I'm not sure if I have the modified version or the other one here, but at least I need to log in now. So I need to log in as engineer. And then I need to grab the password, and that is in here, and then check login. And then we take this password, paste it in, and then we can do help to see the commands. And I was to close a valve, I think. Uh, and then I just write 109. And the, because I modified my binary, I changed that one byte in a hex editor, I'm allowed to do it. It doesn't stop me anymore. And then also, oh, I'm breaking. And then we can also see that the actual data is being sent here. So now I have a new identifier, it's 185, and here is the actual data. So this time, these two are the flag. There is, of course, a billion ways to solve this, but I thought this was the fastest and easiest one. For the fourth challenge, that was the coolest one, I think. Um, where are you? There. In this one, we are uh, we have to log in as the administrator to reset uh, the HMI. And we have to do it uh, towards the this live instance running at first infrastructure. So then it says we're not supposed to crack the password. I haven't shown you, but the, the way it checks the admin password is actually it converts it to a SHA. 256, I think, or SHA-1, maybe. And then it checks it uh, towards the hash uh, that is in memory or in the file. Uh, and uh, of course, we looked at that hash, and there was no kind of known uh, reversed value of it. So we didn't bother anymore. But then the goal is to find kind of, we actually have to pwn the binary, find a way to bypass the restriction. Because if we look uh, here, what it does, uh, in this one, I actually did some modification to the binary. So I think I'm going to show you in this one first, which is the kind of without doing anything in either. So we go to the connection handler. We go and check here what it does. This is what we looked at earlier. It does a login and then it calls the check login function. It takes the return value and it compares it to if it's B8 hex, then you're logged in as the engineer, which we can successfully can do. And if it's uh, you successfully log in as the admir, admin, it's uh, C4. And then we can notice that it also uh, sets this V12 value to the same. Uh, and if we scroll further down to see how the uh, factory reset is done, it first checks that V12, the value set above there, is C4, meaning that you're logged in as an admin. Uh, so then like the first thing I thought this was about was, of course, the check login function. But this is all sound in here. It does everything correct when it checks and does yeah, it's a SHA-1 hash. So this is all good. No vulnerabilities here. And it's also like when you look at it now, that V12 is here below the password. So it doesn't like it's not super easy to see what the problem is. And you can also see when it reads in the password, it reads in 31 bytes, uh, 20, hex 21 or 33, I believe, which is a bit odd. Like I guess you can kind of know what this is 16. Maybe this should have been 32. Why are we reading 33? And uh, from this, you can kind of start looking at it and understand what's going on. But what I did to make this easier for myself was that I saw it read uh, in the connection handler. I saw that it read 33 bytes. So then I just went here and I changed this to the user buff, which is, which is the username that was 16 I read in. So I changed it to a uh, character array of length 16, and then I changed this to a password uh, buffer of length 33. So then what happens is that you can see that all of this initiates it to zero, which is fine. But then you can see it like when it does the compare here, for example, when you want to open the, the valve, you can see it's actually part of the password buffer it's checking, the last byte of this which you then control, of course, because you can read in a password to the buffer, which is 33 bytes long. So then to solve this, what you need to do, if I just break out of them, that one, and I just want to disable my breakpoint and continue. 
Uh, what this is just, all of this up here is boilerplate code. Maybe I should zoom in a bit and full screen it. Uh, yeah, this is uh, Pwn Tools boilerplate. And then what we basically do is you can uh, receive until input, you send the login command, you send whatever username you want. And then you also can send whatever 32 byte you want. But the important is that the 33rd byte is a C4. I just send them all a C4 just for fun. Um, this rest here is kind of messing up the or explaining the uh, last challenge already. But uh, if I run my solve script, let's just comment out this for now. And we'll do interactive. So if I run it, oh. Uh, you can now see that I'm logged in as an administrator because I can now reset it. So if I reset it, oh, reset, of course. It asks if I want to, and I say yes, and then it sends the factory message. Now it's local, so I won't get the flag back, of course, and the remote server is taken down, so I can't really show you that you get the flag. You have to trust me. So that's how you bypass the, the admin password. And the last challenge is a command injection one it is here so this time uh, it asks still going against the remote instance can you execute remote commands on the system and find the flag yeah and you have to wait until you can successfully do it all right so for this one if we go back to the we can actually first there just type help because when you are an admin you have this option to run a command but then you can just run these four three commands and you get an input back uh, but if you try something else it will just fail and say invalid command so then we can go and look here again there's a check valid command function and we can see that there's a blacklist of characters you can't use and then a string compares the string you sent in with one of three, these three. But this is it, like, it only checks the beginning of the string. So you can have more data after as long as it starts with one of these. So then what we can do is to do who am I? And the pipe character is not blacklisted. So we can use that and we can do, oh, we need to do command, sorry, command. And then do who I'll use your name. Your name LS, and then I'll both run your name and ls and as you can see ls is successfully ran and you can see the files i have in this folder and then you can see that there's a flag here which is my local fake flag and then i can kind of try to do uname pipe ls and then or i can try to cat it right flag txt but this won't work because the space is blacklisted so then we just tell me invalid command so then we need to bypass uh, this, uh, this white space being blacklisted. And the way you can do that in Unix, uh, this, I guess I have to show you first as well. Um, the command is run using popen, uh, which again is using sh, I believe, or maybe it's uh, bash. Yeah. So here, if it passed the check, the command you send in, it will use popen to run it on the system. So then we know, or some of us, you can Google for this, uh, like command injection whitelist, white space bypass. You can use this built-in variable, oops, called uh, IFS. So the trick is then to do command and then do uname pipe cat, oops, and then do that instead of a white space and then do flag txt. And then my flag is just lol. And I can show you and verify that as well, cat flag. And as you see, it's just lol. So that's the fourth, no, the fifth uh, challenge and how you solve it. And also, of course, we are hackers. So we had to try. Uh, and also we can expect that there to be a sixth version of this because I can show you now because the server isn't up, but in the home folder, there were two users. So there was the uh, CTF user or whatever the name was. And then there was a root home root folder, which is not normal on the Unix system. So then we kind of had to, how can we bypass the whitelist? Because we can do, uh, oops, wrong window. We can do LS. And now I have actually implemented this. So now it fixes the white spaces for me. So I can do LS dot dot. 
And on the remote server, we saw that there was a, uh, a root uh, folder here, and we knew this is also now wrong, but it, we were in home CTF, and then there was home uh, root. So we really wanted to see what was in there. And in the end, we were able to, to bypass the filter using this uh, expression. So basically, we could use uh, uh, expression like this and do a substring on the environment variable pwd. And this gives you slash home slash. And if we then pipe that to xargs and execute the find, it would search for all, all files in home. And then uh, we figured that we saw the home root, but we couldn't see any files in there. So then we realized that the, this is not part of the challenge. I don't know why that folder was there. We could also do the same for just, if we just use one one here, we'll just take the slash and then we could kind of list the whole file system. And I guess we did, but there wasn't anything else interesting. So I guess uh, that was uh, that, was that kind of. Uh, and I don't have anything else uh, if there isn't any questions. Thank you. Okay, thanks. I'll share back my slide. Uh, just what I forgot to say, thank you so much for hosting the CTF. We had great fun throughout the event. Welcome. So now my screen is black. So we need a few seconds to get back <laughs> to control. Um, Should work. So uh, that will be very short on my side now. Um, so as a reminder, uh, but I guess you know. So the first team you hold, so for the the, the four participants of your team, uh, you will receive an internet device. Uh, for the second team, that will be Raspberry Pi. For <clears throat> sorry, for the third team, that will be a Bluetooth speaker. So for the three team. Um, that win, please don't forget sorry, to send us all your contact details so that we can uh, take care of it. And I guess that was all for me. Uh, we plan to keep Metormos up and running. Um, Renato, I don't know if you have anything else to add on that. Um, but on my side, that was all. And uh, congratulations to all, and thanks for playing. Great. Thanks, guys. Thanks to everybody who played. Thanks to our SEC Lounge uh, chairs who put everything together for us this year, again, virtually. Um, we'll have this recording posted to the YouTube uh, for folks or for other team members who weren't able to view it today live. Um, other than that, thanks again, everybody, for joining us this week. And we hope everybody has a really lovely weekend. Thank you. Thank you.